Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Today we're going to do a final review of the Ambernic Win 600. Now I've been pretty excited about this device for a while, for a few reasons. But the number one reason is the fact that this is the first affordable handheld PC that's available worldwide. But that being said, it's not without flaws, and that's what we'll touch on here in this in-depth review. In English, there's a saying, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And the idea here is that sometimes the thing that's currently available is better than taking a risk on something in the future. And so my hope with this review is to look at all the things this can do right now and see whether or not those things are going to be worth it or if it's better to wait for something better in the future. And in this video, we're going to talk about every little thing that this device can do. For example, the device ships with Windows 10 Home. So we'll look at the PC gaming performance of this device just right out of the box. But we're also going to look at some of the other options that we have available with this device. For example, this is the first device that is officially supported with SteamOS. And while there has been some versions of SteamOS available on the community forums, this was the first one that was actually done in cooperation with Valve. And so all those things that you can officially do in the Steam Deck, for example, the performance tweaks like changing the frame rate limit or the TDP or even FSR, all of those features can be used on this handheld just like it is on the Steam Deck. And honestly, the most exciting thing to me is that this device can also run Botticera. It's as simple as loading up a flash drive with the Botticera image and then loading up all of your games and then just getting into it. And while Botticera is available on other retro handhelds, this is the first time that an x86 version is available on a handheld for under $500. And as I'll show you in this video, the performance on this is very surprising. And so that's my plan with this video here. We're going to check out the performance in all the different contexts with this device. And we'll also do a deep dive discussion about its pricing and how it compares to competition coming down the line. Now, as you can imagine, with a device that can do so much, it's going to take me a while to get through everything. So I appreciate your patience as we get through this pretty long video. So grab a drink and your favorite snack and let's get into it. Now I already did an impressions video about a week ago and I'll leave it linked in the video description. And so I'm not going to retread some of the things I already talked about, like the feel of the buttons and ergonomics and things like that. Instead, let's dive into the specs. There are two different models available. The first one is running an AMD 3020E CPU, and the one I'm reviewing has a 3050E instead. Each model comes with 8GB of Soden DDR4 RAM, which unfortunately is only in one single channel. The 3020E has 128 gigs of internal storage, while the 3050E has 256 gigabytes. It has a 6-inch touchscreen display running at a 720p resolution and 16x9 aspect ratio. It contains a 4500 mAh battery battery, which I've seen to give about an average of two hours of battery life. In terms of wireless connectivity, it has 5 GHz Wi-Fi as well as Bluetooth 4.2, and it also has a USB-C port for quick charging as well as display port out, and it also has a full USB-A slot at the top. In terms of operating system, it runs Windows 10 Home, Steam OS, as well as other Linux distros. And finally, it has two down-firing stereo speakers as well as a headphone jack. Now, since making my first impressions video, the pricing of the Win 600 has come out. And the low-end model starts at $299, and the 3050E starts at $375. Now, those are introductory prices, only available for the first 48 hours. After that, they go up $25 each. Now, looking at a comparison of these two CPUs, you can see that the 3050E has a higher clock speed, and while they both have two cores, the 3050E has four threads. Overall, we're looking at about a 15-20% to performance difference between the two, at least on paper. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, I don't have the 3020E on hand, so I'm not able to test it. And so all the performance you're going to see in this video here is using that high-end model. And so a quick summary of the pricing here. Yes, it does have a $299 introductory price, but it's only for the first two days. And then after that, it's going to go up to $325. And the cost of the 3050E at retail price is going to be $400. And I got to be honest, that's a lot higher than I was expecting. I know that Ambernick usually does charge a premium for their devices, but I was genuinely surprised when I heard that this device is going to be $400. After all, that's the price of a low-end Steam Deck, and this thing cannot compare in any way when it comes to performance. And we're going to go pretty deep into price and competition near the end of this video, but I did want to bring this up here in the beginning of the video that I'm looking at this as kind of being a $400 machine altogether. And so my goal is to try to get $400 worth of performance out of this device. And the first thing I wanted to address was the RAM that they put in this device as well as that single channel speed. So let's go ahead and open it up and see what we can do inside. As a note here, the device is secured by four Torx T6 screws. 
So you'll want to have a screwdriver with that head in order to get it removed. And then from there, you're going to want to use something like a guitar pick or your fingernail to go along the edges and remove all the clips so that you can separate the front and the back. And so this is what we're looking at here. You can see there's a big battery on the side. If you want to be super safe, I would recommend removing the battery cable before making any changes. And as you can see, here is that single stick of DDR4 RAM. Now, if you look at the mega transfer per second speed here, it's 2666. That being said, in the BIOS, the RAM is timed at 2400. And so there's a couple things you could do. You could grab some faster RAM, like 3200 RAM, which we'll do later in this video. Or you can also adjust the timings of this current RAM stick. And a few of the developers and reviewers who have gotten their hands on this device a little bit early have been able to test these different RAM timings. And so far, we've seen some pretty good performance increases without any sort of instability. And so we'll do that here in a minute. Now also here is the M.2 SATA drive. This is using a 2242 stick. As you can see, it's loaded up with 256 gigs. And so if you wanted, this is also something that you could upgrade or have multiple ones. You could have one loaded up with Steam OS and another with Windows 10. And so we're not gonna touch any of that. Let's actually just work on the RAM first. What you wanna do here is power up the device while holding the volume down button. After a few seconds, you're gonna get this BIOS menu here. What you wanna do is toggle that right control so that it's in mouse and keyboard mode and then select enter setup. And now within here, we're gonna get directly into the BIOS. And luckily everything within here has been unlocked. And so let me show you how to adjust the RAM timings if you're interested. What you wanna do is go into the advanced settings options. And then at the very bottom of this tab, there will be an AMD CBS section. Next, select UMC common options, and then DDR4 common options. Finally, go into DRAM timing configuration, and the next screen will have a warning page, so just scroll through that and select I accept. And then select overclock and change it from auto to enabled. Right below that will appear a memory clock speed option, and from there you want to select 1333 megahertz. Now, just in case you didn't read that warning, if you do adjust the memory timings of your RAM, it can cause issues. And it may also shorten the life of your RAM stick. And so there is some risk involved here, and if you see anything funky, then I would recommend changing it back. Either way, once you've made that change, just back out to the main menu and then select Save and Exit. And that's it, you only have to do this one time. Now, one of the resources I want to show you is win.ambernick.com. Within here, it has all sorts of tutorials when it comes to firmware installation. So if you want to install Windows operating system on a new flash drive, or you want to try your hand at installing SteamOS, this is going to have the written and video tutorials as well as the files that you need. So I recommend checking out this page and familiarizing yourself with the available options. You can even dual boot both Windows and SteamOS on one single drive. Now, if you install a fresh version of Windows, there is a driver package that I recommend installing. And also under the third party tools, there's an option for Ryzen controller, which will allow you to adjust TDP within the Windows setting. And so if you need any of these files, I recommend going to their website and grabbing them from their Google Drive. Now for my testing, I did use that Ryzen controller app to go in and adjust the TDP. And what I did is I set the CPU TDP to 18 watts stable. This is probably overkill for some games, but I wanted to make sure I got the maximum performance to show you what was available. And also bear in mind, this does reduce battery life as well. And so what I want to do now is kind of run through all of the different PC gaming performance, and then we'll knock out emulation and things like that here in a bit. To start, I installed quite a few games from Xbox Game Pass just to make sure everything worked okay. And honestly, I think this is where the device shines anyway. These are going to be lightweight games that are easy to pick up and play, and they're also not going to be very demanding on the system, which means that you probably get some pretty good battery life too. Now for the majority of my PC game testing, I just used my Steam library. And if you do the same, I recommend going into Steam Big Picture. It just makes the navigation experience a little bit better. And as expected, when playing lightweight games, things like 2D platformers or indie titles, they all ran really well. And honestly, this is what I wanted the Win 600 for in the first place. Even though I have a Steam Deck, I've always felt that it's a little bit overkill. And while there are some handheld devices that can run Windows, things like the AYN Odin, it's limited to the ARM version of Windows, which doesn't have that much compatibility. And so that's kind of the beauty of the Win 600. Everything just kind of works. Now, in addition to these indie games and 2D platformers, I did want to step it up a little bit. So let's try out some 3D games as well. We'll start with Bioshock Remastered, and I was surprised to find that this one ran at full speed. Now, it doesn't run at like a super smooth 60 frames per second, but it's well over 30 frames most of the time, even in some of the more intensive sections like this airplane crash here. And so I would say that Bioshock Remastered plays really well here. The only thing really holding it back is the ergonomics of these very low analog sticks. 
Same thing with the first Tomb Raider game. This one was consistently over 40 frames per second and was very, very smooth of an experience. But like with Bioshock, using dual analog controls on this is just a little bit awkward based on the ergonomics. And of course, battery life on these two games in particular is going to kind of tank. You're only going to get about an hour, hour and a half of gameplay. Now, in my impressions video, I tried out Ori in the Blind Forest, and that one ran pretty smooth, something like 30, 35 frames per second. But now, with those updated RAM timings, as well as an 18 watt TDP, as you can see here, I'm actually using V-Sync, and it's a stable 60 frames per second. And so we're getting about twice as good performance here from the stock settings to the adjustments we made earlier. Now, some games do struggle. For example, Grim Dawn, I had to turn everything down to the lowest settings possible and then remove things like reflections as well. And it did run at about 30 to 35 frames per second, but honestly the graphics didn't look that great. And so yes, it's playable and the gameplay is pretty smooth but it just doesn't look very good. And finally, the last PC game that I tested here in Windows was Street Fighter V. And I was surprised to find that at 720p and low settings, it actually played really smooth. This is one of those games that doesn't work well with the MSI Afterburner, so I can't show you the stats, but to me it feels very smooth. And as a note here, the D-pad as well as the analog sticks work well for a Street Fighter game. Now also in my impressions video, I showed off some PS2 gameplay and I was pretty disappointed. And unfortunately, even with these adjustments to TDP and RAM timings, we're still getting some pretty bad performance. I was able to get God of War 2 to play at a full frame rate, but I had to do some pretty significant hacks and underclocking in order to get this to work. And personally, I'm looking forward to a better PS2 experience than what we're seeing here. Yes, it's playing at a consistent 60 frames per second, but the overall choppiness of it just kind of takes away from the experience. And so despite doing those performance tweaks, I still am not confident saying this is a PS2 emulating machine. Another example here is Ratchet and Clank. Yes, I was able to get it to 60 frames per second, but again, the hacks that I had to do to get this working just kind of didn't make it worth it. As you can see, the graphics just look kind of crummy and it's just not a great experience. So unfortunately, PS2 still just isn't great on this machine. But don't change the channel just yet. We've got some pretty good performance coming up. Now, the only other emulator that I tried in Windows is going to be Yuzu, which is the Switch emulator. And that's because everything else worked really well in Botticera, so I saved it for that. And I was surprised to find that some light Switch games actually played at full speed. As you can see here, Metroid Dread is definitely playable. It may not be 60 frames, but I would still play it at this speed. Of course, anything that has 3D graphics or something a little bit more intense isn't going to work well. But all the same, I was surprised to find that anything on the Switch worked at all. Now I've kind of got the bug with emulation, so let's test out Bodicera next. This USB drive here has already been flashed with Bodicera as well as all of the games. I did a whole video about this and I'll put a link in the video description. Now to get started, add the flash drive, then toggle the controls to mouse and keyboard. From there, press the power button, and as soon as it lights up, go ahead and press the volume down. This will take you to that same BIOS menu we saw before, but now you'll see the USB partition as an available boot drive. All you have to do is select that, and then it's going to automatically boot from the drive. Now the only other thing I had to do was map my controls, which will happen as soon as you start up Botticera the first time, and I also had to adjust the display scaling and rotation. I'll leave a link to a tutorial for that in the video description. After that, it was smooth sailing. As you can see here, all my games have already been loaded up, and this is just a wonderful emulation station style interface. Now, there are other ways that you could get something like this. For example, you could use Retrobat within Windows, but I really like the idea of putting all those retro games on a flash drive so it's not taking up your main storage. And so, now let's spend a few minutes testing out emulation. Now, I'm not going to focus on any of the easy systems at all. As you can imagine, all of those things from the 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit era are all going to play flawlessly. But before we get into the heavy stuff, I do want to touch on some arcade performance, and Botticera is really good when it comes to arcade gameplay. In addition to playing some of the heavier hitting main catalog games, things like Killer Instinct or even Tekken 2, Botticera 34 recently added support for Model 2 as well as Triforce systems. This means you'll be able to play things like the arcade version of Daytona USA, as well as Mario Kart Arcade. Now, I haven't been able to dive into that yet, but they are going to definitely be playable on this little device. So I think when it comes to handheld arcade gaming, this thing's going to be pretty fun. But let's move on to some of those bigger systems. We're going to start with Sega Saturn first. Now for Sega Saturn, what I decided to do was to try a 2x resolution. It could probably handle a higher resolution, but personally I like to have chunky pixels when I'm playing Saturn, and so 1x or a 2x resolution is perfect for me. Either way, as you can see, it's a stable 60 frames per second no matter what game I threw at it. Sega Rally Championship, one of the hardest games to play, completely fine. So this is a great Sega Saturn machine. Let's move on to another system, let's do Nintendo 64 next. 
Now for this one, I set the upscaling resolution to 720p, and that's the max resolution of the screen, so it works out really well. And long story short, much like with Sega Saturn, anything I threw at it played at 100% full speed. And so again, the Ambernick Win 600 is a very worthy handheld Nintendo 64 device. Now let's keep moving. So Sega Dreamcast is next, and for this one I also set it to 720p upscale. And as you can see here, this one is also running really well. And so at the risk of sounding like a broken record, this is a very good Dreamcast machine as well. There wasn't a single game that I tested that didn't play at 720p with full speed. Usually my ultimate test is NBA 2K2 because this one will rarely run at full speed even on mini PCs, but as you can see here, it's running like a charm. So yes, this is a great Dreamcast machine as well. Next, let's try PSP, and I had high hopes for this one because it played so well on Windows in my impressions video too. And as you can see here, I'm running it at 3x resolution resolution or 720p, and yeah, it's running great. I did find one game that didn't run at full speed, which is God of War Ghost of Sparta. This one I had to reduce to a 2x resolution, but once I did that, it was just fine. And so for those harder games, you know, like Killzone and the Resistance games, those ones are going to probably take a 1x or a 2x resolution. But either way, I would say the PSP catalog is going to be completely playable. Okay, let's talk about the next generation of games, starting with GameCube. And I was surprised to find that in Bodicera, the GameCube performance was a lot better than I was expecting. At first, I was just hoping that it would be on par with the Dolphin emulators with an Android for things like the AYN Odin. But it turns out the gameplay performance is actually quite a bit better on this. For the most part, I could just kind of set everything to a 2x resolution, which again is at 720p, and I'd say about three quarters of the catalog played just fine at a 2x resolution. Now once I started getting to some of the more intensive games, things like Soul Calibur 2 or Metroid Prime, I did have to drop it down to a native resolution. And even then, not every single game was perfect. For example, with Metroid Prime, I did get a little bit of slowdown here and there. But all the same, I was still impressed with GameCube performance here in Bodicera. In fact, even F-Zero GX at a native resolution played at mostly full speed. I would get some dips here and there, but altogether I would say this is still very playable. So next let's try the Nintendo Wii. And this one also played pretty well. 2D games like New Super Mario Bros. Wii played no problem. And even when stepping it up a bit, things like Mario Kart Wii or Resident Evil 4 also played really well. And one nice thing about Bodicera is in the menus you can actually adjust the control scheme and then set them as a per game configuration. It's actually a lot easier to configure than something like an Android version. And it's very obvious that the Bodicera team has spent a lot of time really perfecting the emulation here in Bodicera. A great example is Super Paper Mario. There's a lot of weird graphic things that happen in the beginning of the game that often don't really work in various versions of Dolphin. But the one we have here within Bodicera made everything work perfectly. Now of course this does have an upper limit. There are some Wii games that are going to have some lag. For example, that very first battle within Xenoblade Chronicles did have some slowdown when doing some of those bigger moves. Now personally, I'm just surprised this game plays at all, but all the same, this wasn't perfect. And I would say that Donkey Kong Country Returns was unfortunately not playable. It averaged about maybe 53 to 55 frames per second, which ended up slowing down the gameplay quite a bit since this is supposed to be at 60. Now moving over to PS2, I didn't have very high hopes when it came to emulation performance here, especially because the Windows version of PCSX2 usually runs better than on Bodicera, thanks to the fact that it can take advantage of DirectX. However, the more recent versions of Bodicera have been able to use a Vulkan backend, and the performance has been pretty good. And there definitely were some PS2 games that did play at full speed. I think to give a fair assessment, I would say maybe half the catalog is going to play at full speed in Bodicera. When you start getting past that 50% mark, things like Grand Theft Auto 3 does have some tangible slowdown in the busier sections. And unfortunately, once you start moving up into that higher end level of PS2, it's just not going to play at full speed. God of War is a great example, as you can see here. It's playing at maybe 45 frames per second on average, just not very good. And unfortunately, it was the same story with 3D platformers like Jack and Daxter or Ratchet and Clank. These ones also averaged maybe 40-45 frames per second, and I would find that to be unplayable. Now, one of the bigger surprises with Autosera is that the original Xbox emulation was pretty darn good. I would say that Halo Combat Evolved was completely playable. There definitely was some slowdown when it came to the busier scenes, but altogether, it was still pretty good. However, much like with some of those dual analog PC games, the thing that held me back from enjoying this the most wasn't the gameplay, but actually the ergonomics. And so while yes, Halo did play on this device in Bodicera, I don't see myself actually wanting to play it because of the controls. 
But that being said, I did test out a few other Xbox games, things like Lord of the Rings Return of the King, and this one actually played pretty well. I would say this game is 100% playable through and through. Now other games, like Dead or Alive 3 or Soul Calibur 2, they actually said they were running at 60 frames per second in the menu screen at the bottom left, but as I was playing the game, it actually felt a lot slower than that. And so this is one of those times where instead of looking at the numbers, you just kind of got to get a feel for it. And for a lot of Xbox games, they were just played a little bit too slow. Finally, I did try Halo 2. This is one that I don't test very often because it's very hard to emulate. And unfortunately, it does dip down quite a bit during battle scenes. And so I'm not really sure if you would call this one playable, but personally, I wouldn't do it. And again, a lot of that had to do with the poor ergonomics. Okay, I had two more systems I tested on Botticera before moving over to SteamOS. The first was Nintendo 3DS, and this one was also surprisingly good. On average, I just set everything to a 2x resolution, and I was surprised to find that games like Mario Kart 7 or Metroid Samus Returns played at full speed. Now, not every game was perfect. For example, Super Mario 3D Land, I also played this at a 2x resolution, and it definitely had some tangible slowdown. And so for a game like this, you may want to try 1x resolution instead. Now, the biggest surprise for me actually came from playing Wii U in Botticera. And it turns out that quite a few games on this were completely playable. Super Mario 3D World was nice and smooth the whole time through. And then once I went into the CMU emulation settings within Botticera and then downscaled Wind Waker HD to 720p, this one also played super smooth as well. I gotta say, of all the games that I tested, this is the one that excited me the most. In my initial impressions video, I tried playing this game in Windows and it just wasn't working. But here, the combination of Botticera's low overhead compared to Windows, and the fact that I downscaled it to 720p, which still looks really great in this game, I found that Wind Waker HD was completely playable and it looked great. Now I also ran Mario Kart 8 at a 720p resolution and this also played really well. It was a tiny bit slower than I was hoping for, but all the same, this is still playable in my eyes. I was also surprised to find that Bayonetta 2 was actually fairly decent. I did get some hiccups here and there when graphics were caching, but altogether I think this was pretty good. I wasn't expecting something as graphically intense and fast as this one to play at a good speed. Now that being said, not every Wii U game did play perfectly. For example, Twilight Princess doesn't have the ability to change it down to 720p, so I was forced to run it at 1080p. And unfortunately this device just can't handle that. And similarly, Breath of the Wild just played like a slideshow. This was completely unplayable. This is probably like 8 or 9 frames per second. And so yes, while Wii U is very good on this device, not every single game is going to play well. Okay, so now let's move on to SteamOS. Now what I'm doing here is I'm using a separate hard drive that is loaded up with SteamOS specifically, and then I've installed it inside the device. And honestly, I was surprised to find that it performs a lot like a Steam Deck. The only thing that was really kind of weird about this is that in order to get the quick menu setting, you actually don't press the Windows button. You have to hold down A and then press the Windows button there. But after that, it will jump into that quick menu, and so you can adjust things like the performance overlay or your frame limit, things like that. And the community developers who first discovered this weird hotkey issue, they already let Ambernick know about it, so hopefully it'll be in a future firmware update. Either way, the SteamOS experience here was really nice. In fact, I ended up enjoying the navigation experience here a lot better on SteamOS than I did on Windows. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that this is made to be a console-like experience. And so you can just use your controls to navigate through everything, install your games, uninstall your games, all that kind of stuff. And so at the end of the day, what I probably will end up doing with this device is actually keeping SteamOS on here as my primary operating system, but then also leaving that flash drive in in case I wanted to play Botticera and some retro games too. It's kind of ironic that I'm going to have a device that has the word Win in it because of Windows and I'm not going to use Windows at all. But to be honest, I'm still kind of on the fence about this because the SteamOS performance is not quite as good as it is on Windows. And here's a good example here, Ori in the Blind Forest, which ran with VSync on and had a stable 60 frames per second, only gets about 45 to maybe 50 frames per second here in SteamOS. Now if you want, you can open up that quick menu by holding down A and then the Windows button, and then you could adjust the frame rate limit to 30 frames per second instead. And that will result in a more consistently smooth experience, but you know the difference between 30 and 60 frames per second is kind of night and day when it comes to the overall experience. And so I'm kind of torn about this because the PC performance on Windows was definitely better in this game than it was on SteamOS. Both sides are still completely playable, but all the same, I really like having that smooth 60 frames experience. 
Okay, and the last performance test I wanted to do was to swap out the RAM and see if that made any sort of difference from the RAM timing adjustment that we did earlier. And so here I have some RAM that's rated for 3200 megahertz, so I'm gonna swap this out instead. And then what we'll do here is we'll test Bioshock with both. And it's kind of apples and oranges here because I'm not able to play the exact same moments the exact same time. But as you can see from the average frame rate, it's about the same anyway. And so at least in my initial testing, when it comes to performance difference, I didn't find one between the stock RAM that's been updated with new RAM timings or the one that's rated for 3200 megahertz. So really what it comes down to here is probably not the performance difference, but rather the longevity of that RAM stick. If you use one that's rated for a higher speed, then it's probably going to last longer than the one that came with the device. Now once I did change out that RAM, I did try a couple other emulators just to make sure that I wasn't seeing any sort of difference, and the results were kind of mixed. When it came to PS3 emulation, there was no difference at all, but that makes sense because the bottleneck here is the CPU, not the GPU speed. As you can see here up in the top left, all the different CPU cores are running at 100% low. So an update to the RAM timings and the GPU speed aren't really going to matter here. Now I also tested out PS2 gameplay, especially with God of War here, and as you can see, the gameplay experience is a little bit smoother, you may be getting an average of 2 frames per second higher, but definitely not something to write home about. Metroid Dread also felt a little bit faster here in Windows, but again, it was kind of hard to figure out whether or not this was genuinely smooth gameplay, or I was just kind of making it up. Same thing happened with Mario Kart 8 within Botticera. This one also felt a lot smoother. In fact, I would say this one played at full speed. And that's not something I felt when I was using the original RAM. So there might be some performance differences here besides just the longevity of the RAM stick. Now, something else that people asked me about was cloud streaming. And so I did a couple tests here. For example, here I'm using Xbox Game Pass under the cloud. And in my testing, everything worked fine. The buttons corresponded exactly as I was hoping, and so no problems there. Now, the quality of the stream is pretty bad, but I recorded this on a Sunday night on a holiday weekend in Hawaii, which means that it's just not a good time to be testing. And so I think the quality of the stream is not an indication of the device itself, but rather where I am while I'm testing it. Same thing happened with Google Stadia. The buttons all all worked perfectly, everything worked as I was hoping, but the streaming performance was pretty terrible. In fact, I got kicked out of the game just a few minutes into it. Which again makes sense because Hawaii isn't even officially supported by Google Stadia. Now that being said, I did try some local streaming just to make sure everything was okay, and so here I'm using Steam Remote Play to jump into Yuzu on my home PC, but then controlling it from the Win 600. And because I don't have to deal with the Hawaii internet speeds, everything was working just fine internally. And so if you have a more powerful PC in your home and you want to stream to your handheld, this will be a great solution. But that being said, there are other devices that are much cheaper than this because they can also do the same thing. Either way, yes, streaming works just fine on this device. Alright, we've been at this forever now, so let's go ahead and start wrapping up. Starting with what I like, I do think this device is comfortably chunky. As I showed in my impressions video, it feels pretty good in the hands. I like the fact that it's a little bit thick and it does seem to be a nice size overall. I also think that thanks to the nice D-pad and face buttons, this is a really good machine when it comes to D-pad gaming. So if you like 2D games or indie platformers, things like that, this might be a great fit. The screen size is also really kind of perfect when it comes to a handheld PC. I think 6 inches is really good. Now, despite the fact that it only has digital triggers, I did find that these triggers are very nice to press down on. In fact, they're the best ones that Ambernick has ever released. Now, one of the things I love about this being an x86 device is that you have multiple boot options. In addition to running Windows 10 or Windows 11, you can also boot into a legit version of SteamOS. And as we saw earlier, you can also run off of bootable flash drives, things like Botticera or other Linux distributions. And the emulation performance on Botticera was nothing short of amazing. I was surprised at how well this played. To be honest, when I first started up Windows and started loading up emulators and things like that, I was pretty disappointed. But as soon as I got Botticera running with all that really nice emulation station interface and the customizable controls and everything else, I was just very happy. And I was super surprised to find that all the way up to Wii U, I had pretty decent emulation performance, other than of course on PS2. And along those same lines, I really appreciated the fact that it had a USB-A slot at the top of this device. It made adding a low profile flash drive very simple and non-intrusive. It almost makes up the fact that this device doesn't have a micro SD card slot. Okay, so now let's talk about what I don't like about the Win 600. Number one, I don't really like the feel of the slippery plastic on this device. It feels very different from any other Ambernick device before. And honestly, it feels kind of cheap in the hands. I'm not sure if the gray model will be like that as well, but the white one in particular just feels more like a prototype than a real device. 
And I went into depth about this in my impressions video, but the analog stick placement on here is really not good when it comes to dual analog gameplay. It's acceptable when you have just a single analog to use, but honestly, the only time this device feels very good is when you're using the D-pad. Battery life on this also leaves a lot to be desired. I got about an average of two hours, and that's when I'm using a mixture of emulation and light PC games and some streaming. If you wanna play any of those more intensive PC games or things like Wii U, I would expect only about an hour, maybe an hour and a half of battery life. So definitely keep an external battery source or something handy because you are gonna need it. And like I've mentioned several times before, the PS2 performance on this is just not very good. Everything else is really impressive, but if you're looking specifically for a PS2 device, I honestly don't think this is it. And the last two really have to do more with some of the decisions that Ambernick made when rolling out this device. Number one, I think they made quite a few decisions that were not very consumer friendly. First and foremost, that single channel RAM just really doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Either the engineers just just didn't realize that dual channel RAM is something that's basically required for AMD chips, or they made the decision to save a buck or two at the expense of the customer. Secondly, the lack of a micro SD card slot is also kind of uncool. That would have given me the opportunity to have a lot cheaper storage options, and it's also a lot easier to access than taking off the back just to remove the hard drive. On top of that, you could have loaded Botticera from an SD card. There's just all sorts of reasons why this was a bad move. And finally, the last topic and the one that we're going to cover here in this next section is the price. As a quick refresher here, the retail price of this device is up to $400 for the 3050E model that I reviewed. And honestly, when I first heard about this device, I thought that at max this device was going to cost $300 for the 3050E. And generally, I'm actually pretty close when I make my predictions, and I was surprised to find that I was a whole $100 off. And I think that maybe a year ago, if someone said, hey, for $400, I'll give you a device that can play all these games, I might have been tempted. But here in 2022, in a post-Steam Deck age, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. In fact, there is competition coming down the line that's going to make this an even worse deal in about six months. AYN, the company that released the Odin, has now announced a new device called the Loki Zero. And this one starts at $199 and has that same 3050E processor. On top of that, it has analog triggers and the availability of dual channel RAM. On top of that, it also has offset analog sticks, which may make it a much better device for dual analog gameplay. And so we're looking at a device that is potentially about half the price, but can give more performance thanks to that dual channel RAM. Now it's not a one-to-one -one comparison for for example, this one only has 64 gigs of online storage, and you do have to pay for a little bit more. But this also does come with a micro SD card slot, so you could put your storage there instead. All told, when I made a pre-order earlier in the week, it cost me about $278 altogether. This is before they made the RAM as a free upgrade in July, but all the same, I would expect to pay about $275 for a device that probably is going to have better performance than the Win 600, and potentially better ergonomics as well. Now, that's only when comparing two devices that have the same chipset. What about things within the same price range? Now, the first thing you might be thinking is the Steam Deck itself. The lower end model costs $399. And of course, the performance on the Steam Deck is much better than on this device. But of course, bear in mind that there is a backlog of Steam Deck orders. And even on their ordering website, it says it's not going to ship until after October 22 or later. And so even if you ordered the Steam Deck today, it might be the end of the year or early next year, before you actually see it. Now within that sub $400 price range, there are other devices that are coming down the line as well. One that got me really excited is this one here, the Ioneo Air Plus, which is running an Intel Core i3-1215U. This is a newer chipset that should have some really great performance. And Ioneo plans to sell this device for $299 or $269 for early bird pricing. And like I said, the performance on this is out of this world compared to the other one. In fact, it's probably maybe three or four times better than the 3050E for a device that's starting at $299. Now, AYN also kind of picked up on this as well, and so they added an upgrade option to their Loki Mini Pro model. And this will take the $279 device and then add another $70 to it to give you that upgrade. And on top of that, you can also upgrade the RAM to 16 gigabytes as well. And so here at $389 before shipping, we're getting a device that's much more powerful than the Win 600. You throw on the shipping there and it's about $425 altogether for something that's still quite powerful. And so here's a breakdown of those four devices we just talked about that are all kind of equal when it comes to the same amount of performance or the same amount of price. When it comes to the performance side, the 3050E is also in that AYN Loki Zero, but 
it's at a lower price and does have some nice additional features like analog triggers and a micro SD card slot. And then of course, when we're talking about the same kind of price range, the AYN Loki Mini Plus with an i3 upgrade, as well as that iNeo Air Plus that has that same chip, those ones are gonna be much better when it comes to performance and they're still about that same price. Now, that being said, there are some negatives here. For example, all three of those other devices are not slated to release until quarter four of 2022 at the earliest. And when it comes to AYN products in particular, I'm a little bit skeptical about this date too, because they have a very large backlog of AYN Odin devices they still need to deliver. In fact, I ordered the Odin Lite in the first few minutes of the device being available, and it still hasn't delivered, and it's been almost a year at this point. And so that company still needs to deliver all the Odin Pro and Odin Lite models before they start shipping out the Aldi Lokis too. And they have five different Lokis that they're planning on delivering at that same time. Logistically, I'm just gonna be very surprised if they can pull that off. Now, Ionia also has a similar problem. They have a lot of devices coming out in the future. I'm not even sure how many different ones at this point because they keep announcing new ones like every week. But at this point, I think there's something like six or seven that are coming down the line. And these also are supposed to be releasing at the end of the year too. And to top this off, we haven't seen a prototype of any of these devices as of today. And so as it stands right now, yes, there are some devices coming in the future, but they only exist on paper right now. And so in summary, there is a lot of promise with these AYN and INEO devices coming in the future. But at the same time, there is some risk that these devices will not deliver on time. And there's just a lot of unknowns about these devices altogether, other than some very pretty renders. At the end of the day, across all of these platforms, only one device is available right now, and that is the Ambernic Win 600, for better or for worse. This is a device that has quite a lot of flaws. The single channel RAM, the poor ergonomics, as well as that battery life do keep me from enjoying this device as much as I'd like. But all the same, there is a difference between a device that looks promising on paper and the one that you can order and have within a couple of weeks. And so when it comes down to it, we're back at that same old saying that I said in the beginning of the video, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And so when it comes to deciding whether or not this device is worth buying, it's really gonna come down to context. If you saw the performance in this video and you want to be playing that right now, then it might be worth it to consider buying this. Also, if you happen to be living in a region that doesn't have the Steam Deck as an available delivery option, this might also be able to hold you over until something better comes down the line. Personally, it's hard for me to recommend this device, especially at that $400 price. There were definitely some moments where I was genuinely surprised about the performance of the Win 600, especially when it came to things like Wii U or 3DS. But there were also definitely some times when I was frustrated with things like the ergonomics. And so in the end of the day, this is a very mixed review. This is definitely the most powerful device that Ambernic has ever released. And it was also one of my most anticipated launches as well. But now that I have the device in my hands, there are just as many things I don't like about it as I do. And personally, I don't think for a $400 device, you should have those mixed feelings. But let me know what you think in the comments below. Is this something worth considering or what would they have needed to do to make it more worth your while? As always, thank you for watching this extremely long video and be sure to like and subscribe if you found it helpful. And we will see you next time. Happy gaming.